I sort of feel like I could just talk, do the presentation this morning about Hillel, because I'm such a fanboy of him. Um, he's, you know, he's accomplished a tremendous amount of, of diverse activities in his career, and I'm sure he's going to tell you about a lot of those today. I hope he is. Um, but whether it's, you know, running his UX consultancy, um, writing books, uh, or um, talking about Legos, which he does a really good job of too, just so you know. Um, he's an amazing guy, and I'm really thrilled that he uh, has offered to sort of come in and do this for us today. So please help me uh, welcome Creative <laughs> to Creative Mornings, Halal Cooperman. Um, so I, I really, I, I don't exactly know how this talk is going to go. I've never talked about this before, I've never given this talk before, and I don't know if any of you will relate to this. You may, at the end of our time together, say, wow, this guy's got some issues. Uh, or maybe a couple of you say, yeah, I feel that way too, but we'll see. We'll see what it is. Um, you know, this, the, uh, I, I love those, I couldn't, I, I didn't list it here, but I, I love those quotes where someone says, you know, the act of creating something is a, an incredibly narcissistic and selfish act. Like, why do you think the world needs that? Like, okay, maybe for Jonas Salk it's not, right? But like for all of us, and I, no apologies if anyone here is like, you know, curing AIDS, good for you. But for everyone else... Really, does anyone need anything we're creating? Need, I mean, does the, sorry, will the world need, like will the world be okay without it? And the answer is, at least for me, for the things that I usually spend my time on, yeah, the world would really just be fine. They really won't care at all. And so to actually think that despite that, that I should make something is, is just patently ridiculous. Um, and um, I, you know, there's a version of this quote that I can't find where the quote is longer. It's something like, I don't, like, the, the more I know, the less I realize I know, and I don't trust anyone who doesn't think that way. Because they're, in, like, anyone who comes to me, I, I'm botching this, but anyone who comes to me and is like, oh, yeah, I know it all, I'm like, ah, <laughs> whoa, whoa, yeah. Like, if you said I don't know anything, I'd be like, really, tell me more. Um, but, but I'm just like, you know everything? Like, you scare the shit out of me. So, and I generally think this is a good philosophy to have, but I think, um, I think it's, it's not always served me well because there's so much I feel like I don't know. There's so much, especially around being creative, around making stuff. There's so much that I feel like, oh, well, I, like I go and I see something beautiful that someone's done, I go, whoa, they, they know. I don't know. They know. And, and it's just given me this feeling like, you know, my whole life, like, I've, I, I'm not the creative person. I like to be around creative people that I work with every day and that I'm friends with. But I'm not that person, but I, I recognize it. I like it. And, and so I, I, we're going to have a little therapy session now. I'm going to go back to uh, middle school. That's me. Uh, yeah, no one, th my best friend was this kid over here, who will feature prominently today, <laughs> the little chubby kid with his eyes closed and the bowl haircut. We were kind of the losers of the class. Uh, his name is Roe, he called it Roy in English, I guess, but Roe in Hebrew. And uh, this is the uh, Jewish day school I attended from sixth to eighth grade, where they pretty much fucking tortured us. I mean, they were awful, <laughs> awful people. That was the girl I had a crush on, Beth. Uh, and then, I mean, we used to get the shit kicked out of us by the, 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 the woman up to the girl up top. <laughs> uh, they really didn't like us on this day because Roey had accidentally hit this kid in the face with a baseball bat and broken his nose just in time for the class picture. <laughs> it was an accident, but believe me, that little fucker deserved it. Um, oh, there's going to be a lot of swearing today, I've just in case you hadn't already figured that out. 
Anyway, so I, I have this, I, I'm a, a borderline hoarder, like not enough to get on the TV show, but certainly enough to like, you're like, what are you doing? Um, and so I have a lot of boxes of crap that I've collected over the years, and I went through this box, and even I was surprised at what I found. So we're going to go back. This is, I think, sixth grade. So when you go to j private Jewish day school, you know, you don't, you get little blue note. You guys have little blue notebooks? That you, yes, but ours have like a famous rabbi on it. Uh, Maimonides, who's like, you know, big time. He's like LeBron of rabbis. <laughs> and, uh, and you'll notice even like the light from his candles like emits in the shape of Jewish stars. I mean, it doesn't get more Jewy than that. Uh, and so you would think that inside my notebook, I was, you know, busy studying Torah or the Talmud or math or whatever, anything, Hebrew. No, I was drawing pictures of cartoon characters, which by the way, I would sign as if it was the Mona Lisa or something. Like put, sign my little name there. And these are, all right, they're not great. You know, and I was co copying, you know, I'd look at it and just copy. But I would say my Scooby-Doo is pretty fucking good for sixth grade, <laughs> right? That's the highlight, by the way. There's some real bad ones that I didn't. And by the way, every time I came in this box, I came across something embarrassing. This is what would happen. I would go, oh, no, I'm not showing that. And I'd be like, oh, I got to show that. So uh, on the next page, I found uh, Ziggy. Like, really, just the, the most awful character. Like, just so easy to draw and so not funny. Right, like, like uh, what was that spinoff from Garfield, U.S. Acres? Like, that's a laugh riot compared to Ziggy. Anyway, so I would just spend a lot of time drawing uh, cartoon characters, and I, I don't consider myself, you know, a drawer. Uh, and then, <clears throat> back in sixth grade, seventh grade, video games happened. And I was like, oh my god. And, uh, you know, we would pour over these catalogs of Atari 2600 video games. This, this is not from the web, this is from my personal collection. Um, and uh, <laughs> and Roe and I would, would invent our own video games in sixth grade, you know, with pen and paper. So, of course, it wasn't enough to just draw one game, I had to come up with the whole system. The Star 10,000, by the way. <laughs> Notice the pixelated font. That's just a division of Tesseract Inc. I just want you, there's a whole, oh, oh, no, 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 just wait. <laughs> uh, yeah, we did a little logo explorations, a little tagline. I don't know, I think that's cartridges getting stacked up. A uh, little hardware rendering. Uh, I, I'd like to point out the uh, 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 branding on the space bar. <laughs> Something's pretty fucking novel. And the games. Uh, you got your, I'll just start with, from worst, you got your Defender clone, or maybe it's licensed, I don't know, you got a little racing game. I, I like the headlights, right, the light, that's not bad. The pinball, you got to deal with that aspect ratio, it just doesn't work. Uh, and then the one I'm most proud of is this sort of adventure altered beast kind of thing with that glowing chalice. That one seems promising to me. The others seem, you know, eh. And then, of course, it wasn't enough, you know, you have to have like a magazine that came along with it. Uh, <laughs> This is another one of those little, there's a rabbi in the back of the magazine, <laughs> by the way. And when, and when you open this up, when you open this up, oh yeah, and by, by the way, there's even like all these sort of like weird business things going on, like ColecoVision and Star 10,000 merge to make Super Set, what? Like, I, like mergers and acquisitions, I mean, it's sixth grade, right? What am I doing? And then, um, and then in the, this is so weird and, and borderline racist, and I apologize, but, um, you know, the ad on the inside was an American typewriter that can type Chinese faster than you can say, and then some fake Chinese, this is racist, right? Yes, maybe, no? I asked Jenny, she said no, but I think she's just being nice. So, and I, I don't know what that is, really. Now, in the meantime, I'm busy making my racist ads and drawing my shitty video games for the Star 10,000 and planning my corporate takeover of Coleco, and my friend Rowie is doing the same thing. He's drawing his own video games, and that's these. And I'm like, fuck. <laughs> so basically, we are enacting a full-on console war in the back of the class, in the back of like rabbinics class at Solomon Schechter Jewish Day School in Newton Center, Massachusetts. We're having a console war. And just to give you a little close up, I mean, look at this shit. Look, at, I wanna play that now. And look, he's like parasailing and shit. What the? It, so of course, we couldn't let this stand. So the folks back at Star 10,000 said, fuck this. 
we've got to come out with a new console. So we unveiled the Tesseract XL. That's right. Started making more games, these little thumbnails. And I was gonna have descriptions in there. I had logos and names and, and uh, you know, just tons of these things. Uh, I, I, saloon seemed kind of cool, like a shootout. Uh, anyway, so th this, this went on, and then Rowie just kept drawing. And I was like, oh! Just more of these. And I'm like, look, Science Lab! Where is that game today? This is in like 1981. What, why haven't, hasn't anyone made that game? And, and this is some kind of like a missile command clone, but, but look at it, it's like in 3D, and, or it's two and a half D, I guess, and it's, the, it's beautiful. Look at those ships. And I don't know if this is like a gas station here. I don't know what that is, really. But, so I was like, okay, we gotta do something. Maybe the marketing is wrong. Maybe we need bigger images of our, our uh, thing. So, and we also need bigger concepts, so the Revenge of Zardon. So you remember the Krytolians? They're the aliens that launch the, the attacks in Missile Command, Galaxian, and Space Invader? Well, this is your chance to get even your, the aliens, coming down on their city. High concept, right? <laughs> right? I, I tie them all together. It's like a crossover. Um, and, uh, and, but this, it still, it looked like shit. I was just like, God, he can draw, and I just can't. And so I was like, okay, new, for that new system, the Tesseract XL was like the GameCube or something, or, or the, no, the, what was the Sega one that just died, it was like lasted for three, yeah, it was a Dreamcast. Fuck that, let's just pretend that didn't happen. We're going to the next generation, the Gamma Vision, and it's big brother, the Gamma 5000 computer. <laughs> Now, I generally do not like reading from slides, but I'm going to read you from the Gamma 5000 newsletter because you need to hear about my plans at the time, right? I couldn't compete based on talent, and I couldn't compete based on, like, art and creativity and drawing. Like, I knew. I, I just wasn't good. So, uh, news of the ultimate video system computer has just arrived. Gamma Inc. has merged with every company available. <laughs> <laughs> that deals with home systems, arcade games, and home computers. Uh, best licenses, ultimate experience, blah, 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 marketing, blah, blah. Video game system packages a home computer that is comparable to a big computer that business companies such as IBM use. Not make, but the ones they use. Um, or you can buy the ordinary video system that can be upgraded gradually to make it the same and, but stop worrying, you won't have to throw your old system because you can trade it in for half its original purchase price towards your purchase of the Gamma 5000 and you can also buy the universal cartridge disc cassette that will take all your old, it just all fucking works, right? This is it. I will just destroy him through like backwards compatibility and like exclusive licenses. But there were games too, and I was like, I, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna get some games. I'm gonna license those Flintstones, the Jetsons. I got my Jetsons back, and some original Suicide Sidewalk. Okay, I'm not saying the art is good. <laughs> I don't know if I understood the way parents made decisions about purchasing video games. It's probably something with the name Suicide in it. it was not something they're gonna buy, but, but. Uh, but I think that's a pretty cool game. And then uh, also, uh, again, not really, maybe an M rating. Back alleys with the dagger <laughs> in the logo. I want to play that, really. And I have to just, I look, some of them are licensed, okay? But, but, and also, why did I pick, I, you know, even as I look at this, I'm like, why don't I stick with the fine point pen? I used like a Sharpie down here. It just looks like shit. And, um, and eventually I plan to color these in and write descriptions. I never got to it. But, uh, but okay, it's better, right? I'm, I'm like, because I'm I'm, we're competitive and I'm trying. And of course, my roller coaster game, sir, but it's a circus. It's really a carnival. Circuses don't have, I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> anyway, so all of this came to a head in our eighth grade yearbook, which I drew the cover for, okay? Check that shit out. Yeah, I don't know, like maybe I should have just drawn some pencil lines first. I signed it, by the way. <laughs> Gotta get that signature in there. And then uh, this was my, we, we each, you know, this is a little Xeroxed yearbook. So this was mine. And, uh, and, and years later, he's a multimillionaire video game king and composer. This 13 year old just happens to own the Boston Celtics. <laughs> this is Rowie's. You finally get a chance to see my body. But what you may not have noticed, what you may not have noticed is in mine, there was this little ad. The Star 10,000 versus his Tesseract. He, his was called Tesseract. 
Check out Horror Caverns versus that shitty adventure. And I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember, but the spokesman for Mattel on television at the time was this guy, George Plimpton. And uh, there is no comparing the two. As you can see, Star 10,000 beats Tester Act everywhere. But Rowie had a competitive ad in his yearbook half page. And he fucked me again. Like, just never mind the drawing, which is so... He did a better job drawing a shitty game than I did. But then he called it, he didn't even use my name, he just called it Hillel Vision. <laughs> it's fucking brilliant. He just, just, <laughs> I had no chance. So I knew, okay, this, he's just better than me. He's so talented. Like, I was so, like, see, I always recognized talent. And I also recognized I just didn't have it. So, but then I got excited about drawing buildings, because he wasn't excited about that. So then I figured, well, I can't compete here. I'll, I'll go draw shit that, that he's not drawing. And then uh, for my 12th birthday, my parents went to the local Charette, that was the architect supply store, and they got me uh, a protractor, I guess, and some tracing paper. I don't know, it sounds like a cheap birthday gift in retrospect, but I was really excited, and I used to draw like these huge like landscapes. This is like eight, eight and a half, 11 pages, and it's, it's some sort of, uh, I don't know if you could see the houses really, I did my best, but, but they're like sort of 70s, all wood, funky geometric shapes. There's a tennis court. But then that wasn't enough. So I started drawing these huge like complexes and mansions. And then, but I didn't just draw the outside. There's blueprints as well. And for some reason, they all included like 10 parking spots and like banquet halls and bars and dance floors. What kind of fucking life was I thinking was going to happen? I, I, like this is like Bill Gates' house or something. Like I, I don't even really understand it. Uh, but they all had these features. And then something amazing happened. And I don't really remember watching Star Trek back then. My dad is so disappointed because he's like, we watched it every night together. I'm like, I, I don't remember. Um, uh, they, we went to the bookstore and they had this, this thing called the Starfleet Technical Manual. And it was awesome because it, like it, like, it was like a wiki. It was like all this nerdy backstory on Star like the, it was everything, like here's how the ships work and the diagram of the phasers and blueprints and everything. So I extended it to create the special section, right? <laughs> Where I would draw, and I, so I started going, and guys, you need to understand the fraction of what I have that I am showing you. <laughs> it is a small fraction. So I draw, I would add new ships, Right, this one looks like, I don't know, a toaster or a shoebox, something, all right, whatever, and like the insides of ships. And by the way, I don't know how big this, is this a smartphone? There's like a pencil in it. <laughs> there's a pencil and like a, a clip. To, we didn't have post-it, so there's like a clip, I guess. And a fan, maybe, I don't know. This is my UI design back then. Actually, this is my UI design. If you zoom in, it's like this Spartan sort of, ad hoc application of buttons across a <laughs> console. We're just, we're just gonna kinda go with the flow here. We're, there's no pattern we're using. There's no UI rules and regulations. We're gonna ignore Alan Cooper. We're just gonna, you know, I don't know, a little here, a little there. Maybe we'll put like a, a, a three circles here. I don't know, this is my UI design. And, um, and then I, I designed a, a helmet which, and this show is like, I really, I, I had no brand loyalty to Star Trek because Battlestar Galactica was on at the time. Because uh, if you look at this, this was the helmet that they had in the original Battlestar Galactica series. But you may notice something really fucking odd about my helmet. I started making this logo because I didn't like the A as enough of a logo, a Starfleet logo. So I made this thing, and it, it's a swastika, really. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm drawing swastikas on everything. What the fuck? Like, I just didn't even know. Like, you know, it's like that company that names their car or whatever, and then they go to Poland, and it's like, you know, your mother's asshole or something, and <laughs> Polish. Is that bad to say? I don't know. That's a little off. E. Oh, just pretend I didn't say that. So anyway, um, it's gross, right? Not your mom, of course. I'm sure it's lovely. Um, and then... Uh, uh, and my mom, too. Lovely. Not that I know. We should probably just get off this topic. Anyway, so, yeah, I was drawing swastikas and everything. And then, then I started drawing, like, cars. This is, like, the Pontic Aztec sedan, I guess. I really have never seen an uglier car than, than this. And I, you can see I never got to color because my color choices were just awful. Right? Really, really bad. And then and I was drawing spaceships that kind of, and they looked like casino. I don't know what was... And then I started like branding them, and then I was gonna work, and then but I would work them back into the st my Starfleet, 
catalog by putting my little swastikas on them. <laughs> and um, Jet Thrust and the Galaxian and the, my girlfriend says this one should be called the Space Dick, but I don't know. What's cool about this is this has like a shuttle that comes out and stuff, which I think is fucking cool. Um, I don't know about the engineering on those wheels. They look a little rickety. <laughs> and I, cruise ships and like, like cars. Yeah, they were back in my Starfleet thing. And, 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 uh, but the inside of the car is the coolest because the driver is like in a little prison. <laughs> and then the passenger, front passenger seat has a desk. And I imagine, and I still to this day I can see it. It's like all burled wood. Right, with like a little inlaid lighting and lots of burled wood and little compartments for you to do, write your correspondence, I guess, while you're driving. I don't know what you're, and then back there, like a record player and speakers. And there's a TV, I don't know if you can tell, and like little cabinets and stuff. And on the front, I love the huge fucking, like, oh no, I didn't know about tacky or gaudy. I was like, yeah, just put a huge fucking gem on the grill. <laughs> Why wouldn't you do that? And then I learned about comic books. And I was like, oh my god, comic books and superheroes, and I just got nuts about that. And so I had to start making my own. I got really far. Like, of course, I created the whole, you know, the Crystal Comics group, you know. And, uh, and my, I did everything but draw the character. And then finally, I was like, okay, I got to draw the character. And then this happened. Uh, Fire Lord is looking a little rough around the edges, I think. Um, but I, like, but it, it wasn't enough for me. I never did draw the whole comic book or the story. I just drew... I, the, I had character sheets, like I imagined. I don't know, like it was, it was always the, like the infrastructure of creativity that I was focused on, not the creativity itself. Does that make any sense? Like I was busy organizing things for the day when then someone could come and help me make it good. And, um, and this, this is a theme. Now, the next thing I'm going to show you is so, just be gentle. So I clearly, I wanted to be in Starfleet, and like all my, my little sheet said, like, Hill Cooperman, Commander, Starfleet. Not a cat, Commander. I, th I think I thought that was higher than Captain. I guess it's not. It doesn't matter. And, but then I had this whole Batman thing going on where I was like, oh, yeah, Batman. That's, that's, who, that's me. Like, I, I like, had a bat cave set up in the attic, and like, I drew little controls on. I don't have pictures of that, thank God. But I had this wallet slash smartphone that I would carry with me that I made. And I wasn't sure, was I the commander in Nazi Starfleet? <laughs> was I Batman? I was both, really. And just to make sure, if you opened it, there were ID cards. <laughs> like a little, oh, you don't know me? I'm Hello Cooperman Batman. Oh, no, 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 this is a spaceship. I'm Hello Cooperman Commander of Starfleet, thank you. Yeah, so I just made endless. And the logos are there, right? Both logos. Like I've ever, and some like cool, I don't know, there's some like cool other computer language up top there. I don't know, and listings of radio stations and their phone number. I don't fucking know. <laughs> okay, so thank God middle school ended. Woo! And we got to high school. So this is now me and Rowie in high school. This is a little later. Um, and I, th I always think of our skateboards as being in this picture, but we, we had skateboards. We were such nerds. Like, you could, I don't know, I think I look a little not nerdy in here, but maybe I do look, I, we were huge. We were like the. It was like there were the nerds, and we were like kind of somewhere in limbo between the nerds and the cool kids. Like we could talk to the cool kids, or the nerds were like, Rrr. and but like the cool kids thought, oh, you're nerds, and like the nerds were like, Rrr, you're not nerdy enough. And so we were again in this fucking limbo, and and lots of the. I found these lots of little drawings and stuff that it, it got in high school, but were echoes. You know, like a better Ziggy. Fuck, what was with Ziggy? <laughs> What the fuck? So, I so didn't want to show you this. I so did not want to show you this. And then I sketched my parents' car and like my house. But I, all along I thought like, well, that looks pretty cool. It's a little squish, but like it's not like big deal. I just copied something, right? This is what's going on in my head the whole time. It's not like I didn't make something original. I didn't create something. I just copied what was in front of me. And my house too, right? Like, I just sketch, and, and by the way, I, 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 it was so easy to do it the messy way without like making all clean lines, and that just covers over all my fucking mistakes. And by the way, I love trees, because that shit, it doesn't, doesn't matter, it looks like a tree. Um, and then I started, and then I, I, I started designing like, oh, houses, and like, oh, and I, all the blueprints, and like the, of course, like the place where I would sit on my big screen, they didn't even have TVs like this back then, but and a, a, a record player that was like flat like this, because that's cool. And then I started coming up with like, 
uh, like I don't even know I, I don't even know what some of this stuff is. It was this thing called I did a logo exploration for the Creation Space Initiative. I don't know what it did. I really don't know. But it had this amazing office building, which even back then I had co-opted some old building and preserved the facade and built an ugly ass modern <laughs> concrete piece of shit around it. The only saving grace is at least there's no swastika in the logo. <laughs> And then I found this spaceship that I think was made by the Creation Space Initiative, CSI, by the way. And, uh, and it was like this personal ship. You can see the outline of me in there, and I could just fly around everywhere in space and my stuffed animals. And, uh, and, uh, and it was called the OMA Vector. And I just didn't give a shit which letter I capitalized to make my acronym. Like the one man make velocity to what? I think I just gave the fuck up. What? And comic books, here's my, another attempt at Fallen Angel. She fell real hard. Um, and then I found this. And I was like, well, that's not bad. And then I had this vague memory. I'm like, I think I fucking traced that. <laughs> Fuck! Like, I'm so pissed. Like, like I just, and, but then I think to myself, like, and, but this is the way my mind works. This is this pattern. Like, ninth grade. Like, not bad, right? And I'm like, oh, but I traced it. But so what? So the fuck what? Right? And then I, then I, I spent all my time in the library and I, I found science fiction fantasy books. And I read like all the dragon books. Pern, Anne McCaffrey. I was like so into these books. And I was like, well, you know, I can't draw, but I got a typewriter and a computer, motherfuckers. I'll start writing some fan fiction. And so I was writing fan fiction for this, which again, I was embarrassed to show anyone. It was not dirty fan fiction. That, although that would have been okay too. Like, but that's not why I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed because, not because I thought it was bad, but because it wasn't original, right? And then I was like, well, and if you don't know the backstory of the Dragon Riders of Pern, it's actually really cool. Like the story is really, really cool. I recently reread some of the writing. All right, well, but, the, but some of it, but it's not bad, it's good. And, but the story is, ba I won't ruin the story, but, but basically the premise is there are these, these dragons and then you, when they hatch, they have a bunch of kids around the egg and, and when the dragon hatches, it, it, it uh, bonds, it binds with one of the kids and they become sort of mental partners for life and then they go around flying around and breathing fire and kicking ass together. And it's this like really cool friendship. And so I thought this was too derivative because it was fan fiction, I didn't know that term at the time, so I would create a whole new story that I would write, which was about a land where kids bonded with horses, not dragons. <laughs> so as you can see, it's completely original. I think they were flying horses, so, but not dragons, not dragons. They had wings, I don't know if they breathed fire, but, and like a map, and I call it, like, again, no swastika, thank God, a little sort of, Rainbowy logo, kind of not bad. So I did it, and then I, I, I uh, even handed it in uh, as an assignment once. And then, of course, this led to Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> the guy who was the dungeon master, he was one of the uber nerds, right? Like he, like he just, like he had his like a nerd girlfriend. He was, he was the dungeon master. And so they had D&D &D Club, and, and Roey and I were like, oh, this seems pretty cool. We made characters, and we worked on them, and, and Roey's looked better than mine, and mine looked like shit. And uh, we go into D&D &D Club one day in some history classroom, and uh, I swear to, and, and we're going along, and like, you know, 10 minutes into it, mine and Roey's characters die with some encounter with the gelatinous cube. And Sid's like, sorry, you're dead. I'm like, fuck you, man. Like we worked hard on these characters, so we were like, fuck you and fuck Dungeons and Dragons. So, because we just had this horrible experience, it just screwed us. So then I was like, well, maybe I could turn this thing into a computer game. So I literally, they, oh, by the way, all of this was in class. None of this happened at home. This was all during my class time when I wasn't paying attention. In, and I would always say, way in the back, which I still do to this day. So I would write like computer programs where I was gonna turn it all into something and then we were like, well, all right, that's pretty cool, but fuck that, let's make our own superhero-based role-playing game called Superhuman Forces. 
And like, I mean, serious, like the detail in this thing. We didn't play it once, but we made it, right? It was always, again, about the, for me, about the organizing of the creativity as opposed to the experiencing and maps and on and on. And then I got into like making these, uh, like then I decided I was gonna, I don't know. I don't know, really. But it was like I, I wanted to make like joke magazines or newspapers. And so then I was like, for, I went to, I was at Brookline High School, I was like, oh, study halls, who goes? You know, like, ha, ha, ha. But then I went, I, I spent like six months of junior year, three months of junior year in La Jolla in San Diego. My dad worked there for a little while. And, and so I, I made the La Jolla High School underground with like, you know, I love the Rex Reed quote, an incredible collection of garbage. So even, you know, it was like, I don't know, cracked or mad or spy. It wasn't as good as spy. But, and then, then we were busy drawing skateboards. And then I discovered music. And so I was in the concert choir. And of course, the concert choir, uh, uh, we went down. Rowie joined the concert choir, right? Like, that's really where we could meet girls. And uh, concert choir. That was, well, <laughs> listen. Listen, you got to go with what you got. <laughs> and uh, so uh, uh, we went down to Florida, and inexplicab inexplicably, Rowie lost his shoes at Disneyland. I, I cannot, the kid was just a mess. <laughs> like, but I was organized, he could draw, but I had my shoes, right? <laughs> See what I'm saying? Like, and of course, the, the guy, the choir director was so pissed because you're supposed to wear a burgundy tie, and Rowie and I worked at the supermarket as bag boys. And we wore our star market blue and green sti striped tie. So it's like a sea of burgundy ties with these two assholes. With their, he was so pissed. And then I was in the musical, uh, you know, like Gilbert and Sullivan. And then I was in a band and I was writing music. And I was in the concert with, you know, and like we played like a Jimi Hendrix cover on the piano, because it should just really never be done. And, uh, and, you know, and I was like, okay, maybe I can't draw, maybe I can't write, but I can play music. And, you know, I'm in a band. And, like, and it was really sort of an, an amusing footnote about this. The guy there behind the piano, the backup singer, is this guy, you know, in the PC Mac commercials, the PC, John Hodgman? That's him. Yeah. Yeah, we were friends in high school, which was fine. He's a sweet guy. So anyway, so it comes time. High school's over. And now I'm like, I'm starting to feel it again, right? Like maybe music. Maybe that's where I can be somebody, right? Maybe that's where I can be creative. I'd uh, written some songs, which thank God there are no recordings of. I think I still remember a little. And Rowie, of course, he's going to RISD. There was never a question. He was going to art school, right? And I was going to, I was going to take a year off, and I was going to go to Israel for the year, and I was going to go to this jazz school in Israel to play jazz, piano, right? I was gonna, because I, I even then understood like, if I could play jazz, I could play anything. And uh, I went to the audition, and they said my playing was fine, but my Hebrew wasn't quite good enough. And then my dad talked to them, and so they said no. And then my dad kind of wrangled with them a little, and they said, all right, we'll take him. And then I said no. And I chickened out. Like, I just, I just felt like I didn't belong or something. I, I, don't, I don't know why. I, I really don't know why, but it's over and over and over again. And so instead, I went to Brandeis. And not that it's a bad school, it was a lovely school. And I majored in Jewish history. My dad's a Jewish history professor. My mother's a computer programmer. I basically, it's, I just stuck with what I knew. And I don't, I don't know why. Now, we're going to fast forward a little. Rowie went to art school, eventually became a doctor, and still paints and draws and everything. Here's some of his art from now. <laughs> and, and that's him now with his new little baby. Yeah. Me, I went to college, I majored in Jewish studies, and I decided, OK, radio station. Now again, I wouldn't be making music, I'd be playing other people's music. I'd be organizing the creativity of others. And I did draw a little, a very little. I was like a cartoonist for the, for the student paper. But there was my, an, another friend of mine was the cartoonist. He was much better. He was better at drawing, and he was better at, at comic strips, because comic strips have a cadence. They, and for me, it was like basically a way to like just write a big, shitty essay like of shitty things that I was, would complain about with like a little, and you know, 
my character in there. And by the way, look at the character. It's fucking Ziggy again. <laughs> God damn it, Ziggy. And then I would, I would use my platform at the radio station and in my, my, school, my school paper comic strip to fuck with this one administrator who tortured me, this guy Rick Sawyer. That's a whole nother story. I could get into it, but we got to keep going. And then I decided, uh, college is ending. I got to do something. So I came up with this idea for a business. Like a, I had all these business ideas. I was like, oh, I'll make a business. And it was going to be a food delivery business. And this is my logo. And I'd like to point out that the sort of embossed, you see, it's called the invisible kitchen because, do you see? Like, I would make the food and deliver it to you, but you would never, OK. You understand. And the, the typeface that I designed was invisible. Ah? <laughs> uh? <laughs> Impressed? Yeah, it's pretty good. I had my van and my logo, a little tagline. I had a business plan, a little layout for the basement that I was going to redo. This section of the business plan is called parental contributions. <laughs> It's pretty cathartic. Um, that didn't happen. Uh, I tried to get a job at a radio station. They said my voice wasn't good enough. I tried to do production at the fucking radio station, which I was awesome at. And they were like, still, no. Like, no, we won't pay you $13,000 a year to splice tape at the Boston NPR station. <laughs> so. I started like this music magazine. I didn't even show it. There's so much I didn't show you. Endless amounts. I started a music magazine, but the magazine wasn't about music. I thought, well, I, who wants my opinion about music? What I'll do is I'll include a CD with it. But that was too early for CDs, so I included tapes with it of musicians that would apply and get in, like curated, like a little. It was a podcast, basically, of new music, and like lists of new music. It was just a way to find out about new music. And then that I learned how to program a database from that. And then I got a job at a software company. And I started out as a programmer. And I just was, again, I always thought that the other programmers, they had something that I didn't have, right? Oh, I, I'm not, I just kind of taught myself, you know? And it's not even they had degrees necessarily. It's just I didn't, I, I always, I kind of pulled my punches on everything. So what did I do? I went back to work. I was like, oh, I'll design the icons, and I'll write the manual, and I'll art direct the box on craft paper, you know, because nothing's changed, really. It's still my aesthetic. Jenny's like, eh, again? Um, wood grain, really, still? And then uh, uh, I didn't design that, but I did oversee the, the, this. We had this Java thing. It's coffee. Get it, Java? Uh. And, like, and then I fell in love with like all the, was it the Clement Mock clip art? Yeah, I used the shit out of that. <laughs> and then somehow I wrangled myself into a job at Microsoft. And uh, I kind of worked my way up. And I realized, again, it wasn't me. But if I could surround myself with people who were talented, if I could surround myself with people who were creative, who were truly creative, not just had an appreciation for creativity and were good at organizing shit like me, then I could get something done. And that's where I met my partner, Jenny. And that's where uh, who we started our business together. And that's where I met some of the people in this audience right now I used to work with. And we together took this and made it into this. Now, am I proud of this? Um, first of all, Microsoft was a, a lovely place to work, and they were very good to me, genuinely good to me. But it was a hard place to work. And um, this was, what we accomplished was like a single digit percentage of what I wanted to do. So no, I was pretty bummed out. So there was a lot of stuff that just still sucked. It sucked so bad. And I thought to myself, like, well, I didn't really do anything anyway. My team really did the good stuff. And the part that I was supposed to do, the heavy lifting of getting people out of the way to let them do more, I've kind of failed at. So what should I be proud of? Like, they can be proud, but why would I be proud of this? So I had all this creative energy still. And, and, and I probably, from high school to now, have probably written about 65 
original songs, right? So I keep writing music this whole time and recording it and not really performing it. And kind of, and, and I, I always, you know, the height of the experience was this blog post on Marginal Revolution, which is a kind of very popular economics blog where someone writes, um, I want to ask for survival tips in case I'm unexpectedly transported to a random location in Europe. Uh, in the year 1,000, plus or minus 200 years, I assume transportation would leave me with what I'm wearing and what I know and nothing else. Any advice would help. And so I love the answers. Could he attempt to reverse engineer or somehow build something which conceivably constructed and be useful? I'm thinking of something like a cotton gin or a printing press. Uh, learn the basics of making soap. Even if you can't convince everyone else about good sanitation, you can still wash your hands. <laughs> it goes on for thousands. So I wrote that into a song. And that was the most popular song I ever wrote because I posted it on this popular thread and everyone was like, oh my god, it's our thread as a song. And like, my music is very, this is going to be very difficult for me to say this in a way that's not self-deprecating because that's what I always do. My music is like breakfast cereal. It's like sugary and like bad for you and like you don't really know what's in it and you kind of don't want to know what's in it. And it's for kids, I guess. It's, it kind of sounds like show tunes a lot. But, and every time someone says that to me, and by the way, you were listening to my music on the way in, which is so humiliating for me. So humiliating. And in fact, a friend of mine comes to me and says, oh, this, it almost sounds like you. I'm like, really? And she's like, yeah, it's great. And I'm like, it is. She's like, oh, it sounds like Broadway. And I'm like, oh, oh. So then, I'm in the home stretch, I promise. Then I discovered food. I was like, oh, food. I started eating, and I started photographing, and I started writing about food. And I wrote, and I wrote, and I wrote, and I had a food blog called Tasting Menu. And this is actually lunch in London in 2003. This is the dessert, and it was made for me by Gordon Ramsay. And this is before he was on TV. So he made it, and it was real good. And uh, this is in Paris at a restaurant called L'Arpege, and it's just a fucking beat in like, like balsamic vinegar, like created in a salt mound. And holy shit, this thing will like make you see Jesus. And I don't, I don't know anything about Jesus, but I think I may have seen him that day. Here's the chef, right? And I took these pictures. And I, and I learned that the more I wrote, the better I got, and the more pictures I took, the better I got. But when someone would say, whoa, that's a fucking great picture, I would be like, well, pff, I take 10,000 of them, you're bound to get like five that are good, which is true. And it's what I always say, because I'm not a photographer, right? And I'm certainly not a writer, so that's why we then made cookbooks with two famous, very well-regarded uh, local chefs, Scott Carsbrook of Lamprea. We made this beautiful cookbook. Jenny designed it. And, um, and then one with Nishino. And then I got nominated for a James Beard Award for my writing. I was the first blogger, food blogger, to ever get nominated for a James Beard Award. And let's put this in perspective for one. Here I go. I'm going to do the thing that I keep saying I do, OK? But let me do it. Number one, I didn't win, which I thought I wouldn't give a shit about because I was like, well, pff, I'm here as an accident anyway. But oh my god, I was like Bill Murray after he lost for Lost in Translation. I was like, <gasps> like I was so crushed. And then because I was like, fuck you, I should win, even though I suck and you're all professionals. And um, <laughs> and by the way, where is all this anger coming from? Like really, what 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 right do I have to be angry at anybody? But more than that, like this is like you know like the Academy Awards for technical excellence. That's like. That's the, this is that equivalent for James Beard Awards, because this is not, they have two ceremonies, one for like all the journalists, like the, no, I, no offense if any of you are food journalists, I apologize in advance, but you know, like, this is like the sound engineers and the lighting guy, makeup, and then, and then in the, not that those are bad things, I'm just saying, at the, at the Oscars, they, get, they don't get on TV, and then they have the actors and directors, so I was in the, the shitty version um, the, the, the night before. So here I am. I write music, and I write about food, and I take pictures of food, and I'm at Microsoft, and I'm just feeling like completely, I just feel like I've done nothing. I feel like all I have are ideas poorly executed. So uh, 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 my business partner, Jenny, and I go, and, and we start this. We start our, 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 our company, our small company. That's us. That's us. <laughs> Cute. And we. Uh, design 
identity and software and end-to-end -end user experience for other people. Now, on the one hand, you could say, well, I'm pretty fucking smart that I partnered with someone as talented as Jenny. Because Jenny is, you, shh, eh, eh, I'm up here. You, you were up here. You had your turn. This is my turn. <laughs> Security? Do we? Because what was I going to contribute? I was just smart enough, right, to partner with someone superbly talented. Superbly. Someone who every day I've worked with her for now 14 years, I think, who I'm still impressed by every day. So you see, that was smart. But also, deep down, I was like, well, thank God one of us is talented, because otherwise, what are we going to make? <laughs> right? <laughs> and so we made a story before bed. And a story before bed is a site where you can record a video of yourself reading a children's book, and the video syncs with the, the pages of the book. But again, it was a site to organize other people's creativity. Right? Now you can say, oh, but it's creative in itself. Sure, OK. I, I get you. But I, again, I'm just showing the theme. And in my mind, you know, OK, that was, I didn't write the books. I didn't draw them. And I, why I have this bar in my mind? Why, I, I don't know. I don't know. Then we, we, we would do these little hobby projects. So I, any, see how I talk about it? Hobby project. So we made a game, Carrot Crazy, which my 13-year-old is like, you should have called it Carrot Carl. I'm like, fuck you, you make a game. <laughs> it's Carrot Crazy. Stop calling it Carrot Carl. The, the fun backstory on this is Carl's got to plant carrots and harvest them in a Pac-Man-like maze. It's a Pac-Man, basically, but you've got to plant and then harvest, right? See, the twist. Yeah, I was like, all right, it's Pac-Man, right? See, self-deprecating. But the cool backstory here was that uh, he needs to, because Jolene is up there, she has an organic juice cooperative, collective, I guess. <laughs> She's a hippie. She's got it, right. And Jolene's like, I need the carrot. And Carl's like, hey, how are you? Here's your carrots, Jolene. And uh, I do all the voices for Carl in the game. And Carl is in love with Jolene. Jolene is, and her partner are very happy. Very happy. And have, Carl is oblivious to the fact that Jolene has zero interest in Carl or any of his ilk. And n none of this is really reflected in there. And it's also a little bit creepy the way Carl is kind of oblivious and kind of all hot for Jolene and making carrots for her. I know. I get it. It's creepy. I understand this. But, um, but that, I don't know. That's what was going Maybe this is why I don't put this out there, because maybe my thoughts shouldn't be out there, because all I do is draw swastikas and make racist jokes and weird, creepy farmers. I don't know. So, but then we did our next big project, Slide Bureau, uh, which is a, 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 a started out as a, a, a competitor for like a slide making a PowerPointy thing on the iPad with these gorgeous templates designed by this team here, beautiful stuff, so other people could could take advantage of their creativity. And all along in this time, as if being creative at work wasn't enough, then one day, yeah, this is way back when, uh, I bought Le uh, my first Lego set. In, as an adult, for my kid. Uh, my kid was four. Uh, oh, whoops, sorry. There we go. My kid was four. Uh, forget that this says eight to 14. He could do it. Of course, me and his mom ended up building the whole thing. And then I got crazy in a Lego. And then I built my house in Lego. And this is what my house looks like. But, and it comes apart, like it's modular, and you go inside. And, and, but I thought, well, it's not really that creative, because all I did was copy my house. Right? And by the way, remember this? <laughs> Look familiar? This is literally what my house actually looks like now. And it was so weird to me that I found this the other day. I was like, oh shit, I moved to a house. It looks just like the one I fantasized about. And then, then uh, me and my daughter decided she was really into American history, so we did like a Boston Tea Party thing. And you can see, look, there, you can see the mid-air. There's boxes in mid-air being thrown. And you can see the splashing of water made out of Lego. It's cool, right? And, and, and then there's the, kind of the whole thing. And see, it's based off this, this painting. See? But then, now let me show you all the problems. Number one, I, I based it off this fucking painting. So what did I really create? Number two, I'm not going to make a pirate ship. I just took an off-the-shelf pirate ship because they're way better. I mean, I built it, but it was a set. Well, I built the house and like all the other stuff. And by the way, those effects of the water splashing are really easy. You just take like two clear pieces and you mount the thing on it. And then when I took my photograph, it was so blurry, you couldn't see the things holding it, right? So it's yet again just another collection of fucking tricks that I know to make something that looks good and not what I would consider true creativity because I know what I don't know. 
I know there's a lot that I don't know, and I know that there's a lot that I don't know about truly being creative, and what I do is not creativity. It's just a bunch of fucking tricks. When you see me pay, play the piano, you may think I can play, but I will tell you the truth. The truth is, nah, I know a bunch of tricks, and I put them together, and I make them look good. Right, but I can't real because I know people who can truly play, and what they do amazes me. And I know people who can draw, and what they do amazes me. And I had another friend. I keep attaching myself to these very talented people. My friend Jeff, who builds Lego uh, like fucking Picasso, and he is talented, but I can't do what he does. Right. But then I decided, well. Me, with the kid, I said, we'll do a project and we'll make this Lego arcade game and we'll put an iPad in there and see it's like a little arcade cabinet and then, but all the UI is made out of Lego and then we made the game work and we put it up in the app store but it wasn't really creative because I didn't make the joystick work. The fuck? <laughs> and then I made this like modular space station. I, this I didn't copy from anything. I invented it and I even came up with this modular it's like meta Lego. Like you, you, build, you just build this thing over and over again, and then it stacks any way you want. And then I built these spaceships on it, which, look, it's a little personal spaceship that he gets in it, and it closes, and then it flies around. Ah, it's the fucking Oma Vector! <laughs> but it really, I mean, what it, it's, just, it's just a building. Like I didn't do something organic. Lego's rectangular, so it's really easy to build rectangular things. And I, and, but I'm good at talking. That I, I know I can talk. And so I, I got a lot of page views on my talk. But then people are like, oh, you did a TED Talk? Oh, so impressive. And I'm like, well, but it was one of the audience talks, and it wasn't an 18-minute talk. It was a five-minute. And again, at some point, I just got fucking sick of feeling this way. I just have had enough. And I don't know if any of you have this voice in you that tells you, oh, that's talent, that's creativity, that's impressive. What I do is bullshit. But I have that voice, and that voice is so unoriginal, and it is so boring. It is so uncreative, because if any of you he have that too, it says the same thing to you. It's going off the same script for all of us. And I wanted to create, you, the pattern, no matter what I did, I would create these little worlds and I'd want to kind of flesh out the details in, in these little places and share them with people and stop pulling my punches. And I turned 44 and I was like, oh, something's in there, it's hurting, it's hurting, I don't think I'm pregnant. <laughs> so uh, sometimes I have weird anxieties and one of them is that I would go to prison And my first, my first anxiety is about someone, you know, cutting me with like a bottle and like shitting down my throat like on Oz. <laughs> as I lay there passed out and, you know, all the commensurate prison style assaults that would happen to me. But my second biggest fear is that I would be really bored. Because I had no internet, no nothing to do. What the fuck would I do? I, I, I literally have gone, what would the catalog be in the prison library? And like, I, I just... So I was like, you know what? I would write. And I, I have the same paranoid delusion fantasy fear about if I were like, you know, incapacitated. Oh, I could always write. And I would write a book then. So it would take being in an accident, becoming paralyzed, or being hauled off to prison, by the way, where I would have been framed, of course, to finally write a book, a novel. I mean, do you see the, the weird walls I built up for myself? For that's what it would take for me to have the courage to, I, someone would have to cut me with a bottle and shit down my throat <laughs> for me to finally write a story. <laughs> and remember, it hadn't worked out the first time I did. I sent my horses with wings and bonding thing and the teacher wrote, as a first paragraph or a first chapter, this is dense and confusing. I think, <laughs> and I have the whole chapter. By the way, it is dense and confusing, but a little encouragement. I'm in fucking ninth or tenth grade, and like you could see her comments just get more and more sparse. And to the end, she just gave up. Like she, could, it was unreadable. Okay, I'm, I know. I'm. I'm. So, I know. I, this is it. We're in the. I'm. Are you, do you guys want to leave? I, I got like. I'm in the home stretch here. Literally, I swear, the real home stretch. 
so I, st I, 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 I started, I, I started thinking, it's, it's in here, what is in there? The little kid with the Batman and Starfleet ID cards, what, what's going on in there? And I really love superheroes, love them, but I don't like the way they're treated often. And, and I don't like the treatments of them. I want my favorite superhero movie, and I'm sorry but if I ruined it for you, but it's Unbreakable, right? It's amazing, just incredible, because it's real. It's all real. And one of my favorite 80s kids movies, or the iconic 80s kids movies, is Goonies. And I don't like the cheesy campiness of it, right? Short round and his utility belt and that weird brother. With, I, scary. But I love the kids. The parents are just fucking, who knows, dead or divorced or nowhere, just checked out. And the kids have the run of the town. And these two things resonate with me. And I started thinking about this whole story about kids that get superpowers. And they have the run of their neighborhood. And that I don't want it to be just a little thing. I want it to be big. Because remember, you know, Gamma 5000 merged with all the available companies. <laughs> and all the game. I have a system. I have an architecture. I have a big plan. And so I came up with an outline for this one story that was little. But then it got bigger and bigger and bigger until it was basically the creation of like a new universe based on our own where superheroes are real and where the powers originate with kids and where thematically there's all these things that are well beyond just, you know, kids on an adventure, but that are about, you know, how, you know, personal relationships and like the way, you know, Jews and African Americans get along in, 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 Seattle and you know or through the years it's the Seattle as a symbol and all these just and I started of course and so it turned into an outline not for one story but for seven seven books seven well I, I didn't know what they were gonna be movies is really what I want them to be because that lets me off the hook because you know I need other people to do that someone creative would come help me and I would start them the first story would be number four you know because Star Wars <laughs> And then I went, I, I'd written, an, uh, 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 I was going to write, finish writing the outline, and I went up to British Columbia alone to a cabin. It didn't look like this because it was like December. And I went for a few days alone, and I was going to write the first, the graphic novel. I think that's what it was going to be because I was like, oh, pff, that's easy. <laughs> right? I'll just write a little words. There's so, I mean, there's so few words on the page. Like 90% of the words is drawing, and I'm not going to do that. And I'll hire someone to you know, do the illustration. I'll find a talented person. And then my friend Kira said, you know, why don't you just write it as a book? I was like, I can't write a book. She's like, just write the book. So I wrote the first chapter. And she said, and I, I sent it to her. And I'm sitting there in British Columbia, like shaking in my little cabin. And she's like, it's good. And I'm like, really? And I sent to another couple of friends. And they were like, it's good. And it wasn't very good, but it was good enough. And then I kept going. And then after I had this first chapter, I knew that the only way to force myself past my own, that voice, was to put myself in a position where if I didn't do it, I would be humiliated. So I called this illustrator, and I sent her. All I had was one chapter in my outline. I sent her the outline, and I sent her the chapter. And I said, what do you think? She, it's this uh, woman, Caroline Hudalaxono. She did these. Yeah, she is the shit. And, uh, but again, the book is 98% words and 2% drawings. But she did, did drawings for every chapter. And then this is the cover. And even through it, I would tell myself, oh, well, it's based on three kids who are like, you know, 7, 10, and 12 that live in Madrona in my house. Oh, that's my kids. And I would tell, oh, it's not that creative because, you know, I'm not that creative, so I just based it on everything. Again, this narrative kept coming up. And then I put out the book. And then Jenny and, and, and everyone at work made me this beautiful thing. By the way, no, that's the house from the book. See? <laughs> <laughs> well, why not? And then and it's, I get to create a world, right? They got me immediately. And then finally, and then this is when it hit me. David is giving me the hook. His daughter read the book. And she sent me this, and it's a drawing of the main character's broken skateboard gallery. And I was like, fan art! <laughs> and I think it was, I don't, I, I don't know what 
this was when it happened. I don't know if this was the exact trigger or not, but it was, it, and I, I wrote a story where I, she got to be in the story with the characters for, as a thank you to her. And, uh, and it was at that moment where I was like, oh, I'm doing it. Stop apologizing. Stop. Right? Like, own it. <laughs> Just such a weird thing. So then I started posting on Facebook, I'm writing the next one. And every week I would post another, like, here I go, here I go, and set deadlines. And then I said I was going to write fan fiction to get publicity for it. And I thought, oh, this will just be marketing, you know, fan fiction. And I was like, and I'm not just going to write fan fiction. I'm going to get, uh, I'm going to go, like, I'm going to quadruple down on fan fiction. I'm going to get fucking Hermione Granger and Katniss Everdeen and Arya Stark from Game of Thrones all together with my main character, right? Now, nah. oh, you, di you didn't want to read a book about my kids and the neighbor getting superpowers? You want to read this shit? And then you're going to fall in love with the, my character, and then you're going to read my books. But then I started writing, and I had to come up with some plausible reason for them to all exist together, and I did. And then that's turned into a novel also. And so now this is out, and these are coming in March. And now all of a sudden, and then I look back at my work, and before I know it, we've written a book. Jenny and I, illustrated by Tom, who works with us, who's not here today. And it's this, nonfiction. And all of a sudden, in March, when I go onto Amazon and I search for my name, there's going to be four, well, maybe not the fan fiction one because, you know, licensing. But effectively, <laughs> on Goodreads, there will be four books that I made and that I created and that I am the creative person behind. That's all I got. So. We already promised you today, if you want, you don't have to, we have our cool how to make awesome stuff book. By the way, mostly Jenny, because she's the creative one. <laughs> and then I also brought, if you want, and you, 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 it, please be my guest, take it. But take it if you're going to read it or give it to someone who's really going to read it, be psyched. And then go post a review, but both, please, for God's <laughs> sakes. Honest review. If you hate it, say, this sucked. This guy spent an hour and a half telling me how fucking creative he finally is, and guess what? He's full of shit. This is the most derivative crap I've ever heard. The introduction is dense and hard to get through, I think. 